Cronin. Hello, Peter. Hello. You're supposed to say good day. Oh, good day. Yeah. <laughs> good day. That's better. There you go. Right. Hello, everyone. So, right. Thank you, uh, Robert. Um, have a rest now. I know Robert's really, really busy. Uh, uh, um, doing like a little uh, with, with his day job. Um, so that was really cool that we, we could get him here. And we've replaced him uh, with Peter Cronin. Uh, Peter, uh, I'm going to say flattering things about you, Peter, because uh, I've seen you on video which, which, uh, in the thing that you, you're going to talk about here, your BBIT um, project. You, you, yeah, yeah, you're talking about how you created it and the, the lessons you've learned. But I've seen you on video. You're really good at presenting, and I love the way you simplify things. And this is this is almost like the exact opposite of, of, of Robert's session. Robert's talking about gnarly, hard things, you know, rocks that are underground and all that kind of stuff. And and you you you're talking about um, something that's that's just that's, that's very very different um, on the face of it, and yet you're talking about it coming from a TOC uh, point of view. So how about I just wh why don't you just amaze us? Um, I hope it hasn't hit the bar too high. I'll do my best. Um, <laughs> give it a good shot. Uh, go for it. And by, uh, by the way, oh, just yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the um, the heads up when we get close, and I may interrupt just a couple of times if there's any need for clarity or any questions. So but apart right. from that, go for it. Sounds good. All right, let's start my timer. All right. <laughs> so I'm, I'm Peter Cronin. Um, for anybody who's not from down this way, you might might be interested that my accent's going to sound like a funny mix of everybody else's because I'm a, a Kiwi, but I've been in Australia for somewhere between six and seven years now. So to all the Aussies, I still sound like a Kiwi, and to all the Kiwis back home, I sound like an Aussie, which is, of course, highly offensive when I go back home and people say, oh, you're Australian. <laughs> but uh, anyway. <laughs> All right. So I'll bring the screen up here. Lovely. Okay. So scaling learning by doing. Now, this has a couple of uh, term has a couple of contexts here. One is, as Clark just, uh, just mentioned, uh, it was exactly what we did for, for our, our Black Belt and Thinking course. And I'll get into the details of, of that in a minute. Um, but essentially, we had to take our course from, uh, from an in-person course into an online course. And the Black Belt, I'm thinking for those who don't know, um, it's, a, it's hard to say it's a training course in the TOCTP course, tools. It started out that way, um, but about 500 students and 10 years later, it's, it's migrated somewhat. I would say now it's, it's the most... Fluency focused and practical version of a TOC TP training course. Not necessarily the most technically correct or the most by the by the letter, but the, the most practical for people, people using it to, to solve problems. Now, the other half of this is why would you care what we did with our course? Um, well, it's as I said, it's, it's very fluency focused in everything, and taking people into a one-week training course in person is one way to do that. Figuring out how to do that online, which has been the roller coaster of emotion that's my last 18 months, uh, has been quite tricky. But uh, all the testing and measuring and trial and error and everything have come out with quite a few uh, interesting insights and injections that should hopefully be useful for any of you who are interested um, in, in online training for, for whatever you're teaching. So, Obviously, being thinking processes, it's important that people actually apply them and they understand them. But the same sort of thing goes for whether you're teaching people DBR, CCPM, anything else, where you want people to be at a certain level of competence that they, they understand it and they actually apply it. We've all, I'm sure, almost everybody here who's had any sort of... Uh, any experience at all, probably, with TOC or DBR has had the somewhat frustrating experience after talking to somebody who learned a little bit about it and said, oh yeah, yeah, we, yeah, I learned about that. Yeah, we've got uh, constraints in our business. Oh, so, so what did you do to apply it? Oh, well, you know, we had quite a few constraints. So we found them all and solved them all. Oh, that's really not the point. <laughs> so with that in mind, I'll, I'll get into it. So to, to set the scene here, the goal that we had was we had our one week intensive training boot camp, which taught fluency in the tools, changed the way that people 
sink, they leave for the you know change impression. And in this case, because it was um, an intensive course like that, and we used the full um, current reality tree process and everything, um, they would have a solution to all their persistent problems in the subject area. Now, somewhat ironically, we had considered making online training for this before, um, but I guess not challenge our own assumptions enough. Ironically, because obviously that's the key part of the course is being able to look at your own beliefs and understandings of things and, and logically challenge those and come up with solutions. But uh, one of the things that, you know, the, the new world situation, it's COVID-19 and everything is done, is whenever something big shifts like that, essentially all it does is forces you to challenge your assumptions. You know, the, probably the predominant one globally being, um, oh, my job can't be done from home or my business's people can't work from home, which has just been forced to be challenged by everybody else to survive. And interestingly, it, it was that same sort of thing that basically forced us to finally actually challenge our assumptions here. So what we had to do was figure out, well, how do we take this one week intensive live boot camp and turn it into an online training course where we still get fluency in, in tool use, we still change the way people think. And because it was a less intensive, especially this, initially this first part of the course, it's less about a solution to all persistent problems in the subject area, more about a solution to the day-to-day -day problems. So I'll start here with the sort of generic solution and I'll walk you through and I'll go through a few specific cases we had to we had to solve. I apologize in advance as well if you're in a dark room. I, I made this slide so, show in a lightly colored room and only now considered that it alternates between bright and dark slides. So sorry if that's gonna, you know, what's that? Anyway, so what we found was after, I uh, probably noticed this about six months in or so, essentially all the decisions we were making came down to this cloud as, as a generic state. In order to have our successful online course, we need to, needed to reliably upskill others. In order to reliably upskill others, we need to be more hands-on. On the other side, in order to have our successful online course, we needed to have profitable margins for it to be considered a success for us. In order to do that, we need to be less hands-on. Now, a lot of online training kind of starts with that bottom side, extremely hands-off, you know, video focused, that sort of thing. But because we were coming from this intensive fluency course, um, we actually wanted to start on the other side of the cloud. But it really didn't matter. All the decisions we had to make, every time one came up and we were discussing it and we were frustrated about it, and we made the wrong decision or we'd done this or that, it turns out there are all decisions about, are we basically putting more of our time into each learner on each course? Or are we putting less of our time in and trying to replace that with, with um, video or something like that? And the most interesting thing is what, what's come through um, through the many decisions we've made is we have as our injection essentially here, the high level injection, what we're calling leveraged elements. So what we mean by that is you're either adding quality, add, adding experience to the course for the individual without adding any of your own time or the opposite. You're maintaining the quality or experience of the course while reducing our own time on it. So once we, once we realized this, it gave us a real framework to make decisions. It was, it was kind of a win-win thing. It had to be one or the other. We, we, to make a change, it had to either cause greater things for them with no greater burden to us, or maintain the benefits they were getting while decreasing our burden. We wouldn't accept anything where less hands-on meant worse for them, for example. So got a few examples of this that, that, I'll, uh, that I'll work through. So to start, oh, I've said, said a little more on the scene actually, um, necessary but not sufficient. So in my mind, there's sort of three kinds of online training, uh, online courses, I'll say. The first, I'm gonna be a bit, a bit rough and say is, uh, is sort of information courses and that's your kind of the sort of thing you might do on LinkedIn. It's a free course. It's essentially an hour and a half of videos and nothing else. Uh, sometimes those are free. Sometimes you charge, you know, 20 bucks for those or whatever they are. Uh, to me, that's really no different to a fancy magazine article or an expensive documentary that you had to pay for. It's not really going to cause, it's, it's information, it's interesting, but it's not going to cause a lot. 
So the, the sort of more serious approach here is um, two types of courses, education and training. I'll focus on education first. So education courses, you need some sort of intentional um, structure to transition people through. They need to learn and understand things as they progress through the course. Obviously, that generally an online course is going to comprise videos, um, some sort of exercises. Those might just be um, quizzes or puzzles, you know, to see that people have got retained the learning, um, supporting documentation, opportunity for question and answer, that sort of thing. Um, so when I say education, what I'm thinking there is the, the outcome is a knowledge transfer. People understand things. Fundamentally, they, they truly understand it, as opposed to an info, information course where they might have grasped a few interesting ideas. Now, an education course, realize quite quickly, is necessary, but not sufficient, uh, in the training course. So you need all of that as well. People need to be, they need the knowledge to be able to apply it. However, the tricky part was, well, what's the sufficiency? <laughs> we, we know it was necessary, but we didn't know what the gulf was between education and training in an online sense to cause people to be able to um, have the competency to use this stuff. So what, it, what it's ended up coming down to for us is uh, actual application. So truly solving day-to-day -day problems as you go. If you were looking at, say, DBR, it would be something about you know, actually identifying what the constraint is, um, things like that, Apply, applying as you go. Community learning. So one of the big benefits to online courses that you don't have um, with two major ones in the in-person courses, one is the space learning thing where people can apply it more as they go rather than sort of in theory. Uh, the other is that you've got a broader community. So on our courses now, we've had a cohort just wrapping up and they've had people from down this way, uh, UK, US, Brazil, you know, all on the same cohort. So you get all these different perspectives and everything. So community learning, being able to engage with others there. Uh, live group sessions. It's one of those things where you don't want to lose that, what I just talked about, that group interactivity um, and the skills that come from that. So that's another, another key thing we've added in there. Um, live support access to instructors whenever you need it, essentially. Um, and marked review or work. You know, it's, people say practice makes perfect, but practice makes, uh, I've just lost the other, other side of that. Practice makes perfect. Practice makes permanent, sorry. So practice makes permanent whatever you're practicing. If you don't have any feedback on it, you're at risk of making permanent the wrong things. So having marked or review work, make sure that people are on the, on the right lines there. All right, so we started with the education. We knew we had that had to have that stuff in there. So we got the videos, we got the exercises, we got the structure and all that basic stuff in. And then we developed the other stuff um, over the last 18 months. And the key three um, roller coasters of emotion, as I say, that I went through, um, I'll go through now. So the first thing is the interesting realization that Running a course, you can consider it like a critical chain. You know, you've got a start point, you've got an end point, you've got time in the middle, you've got activities to be done, all of these sort of things. And initially, you sort of realize, okay, cool, we, we can do that. We, you know, we have um, the key instructors uh, or the key instructor ends up becoming the constraint on our end. Okay, cool, we can manage things around that, is what we thought until we started running it. But what's interesting is in an online course, every participant, they don't care about our critical chain. They're all independent. So every participant is essentially their own constraint in their own critical chain for finishing the course, <laughs> which makes essentially our constraint whoever the slowest mover is. So increasing the flow of everybody was, uh, was our first, I suppose, realization. So our first problem, people weren't keeping up. We planned out all this work. We went, if you think about the leverage thing, the way we started was we tried to drive into the uh, adding value, adding quality side first. We wanted to get the course to the point that we were happy with the outcomes of getting the quality and then figure, okay, how do we leverage this um, while maintaining the quality? But the first thing was, how do we increase the quality without basically blowing up our capacity? Because we could have said, oh, just you know, have a one-on-one -on -one with every instructor every day. That'll do it, but <laughs> probably not the best approach. So we had a lot of exercise and activities, but people just weren't keeping up. 
And one of the major reasons for that was because of that review. That people learn something, they apply it, they review it with, with an instructor, but then they need to update it. And that puts in a, a, a gate where you end up with the, the you know, gains are lost and losses accumulate syndrome because they would leave it with you, you might get back to them. You know, we had it, we have a max turnaround policy of 24 hours. Um, and we try and keep it shorter than that. But depending on time zones and everything, or you've got busy people that try and catch up on a lot of the course later in the week, whatever it is, um, those updates ended up being time gates that would start pushing people out. So the first dilemma that we ended up in, the first big one, was uh, in order to have a useful course, we need people to have greater fluency. In order to do that, more exercises. And the pressure came, in order to have a useful course, we need a manageable workload. In order to do that, we need fewer exercises. So we actually had pressure from customers to have fewer exercises and to get you know, less, less fluency. That was their, their driver, was the manageable workload, which was quite interesting that, that that pressure came up. So where we ended up was self coming up with self-marked exercises. Now, this wasn't for everything. We still wanted the last couple to be reviewed by us to really add, add value. But what's interesting is the, the first few exercises you do on anything, to be honest, they're not great. And that's not, a, that's not a slight on anyone. It's just the first crack you have at something. It's not very good. And so not having to show that to an instructor and knowing that you're just going to have a crack yourself, you're going to have a look at a model answer and you're going to get some learnings out of it. And by looking through people's workbooks, we can see this was happening and, and it's still happening. Um, they sort of cover off all the basic mistakes themselves, which is great. Takes the load off us. So a prime example of where we increased the quality for them. Um, they, people, people loved it. They could flow through the course smoother. They didn't have these, these, uh, these roadblocks coming up. Uh, but at the same time, it was more leverage for us because people were, were essentially doing and applying their own learning for the initial kind of basic, basic errors they're making. And then we would be able to work with them to focus on, on the more advanced stuff to get more, more out of wherever they got to. So that was, that was the first one there. And, and interesting, um, we haven't actually implemented this yet, but with the mindset of this, um, you know, this leverage elements thing going on, the next thing we're looking at is how can we help people mark each other's? So one of the things from the in-person BBIT that's very interesting is when you come to the seven categories of legitimate reservations and scrutinizing each other's work, people learn more from scrutinizing others than they do from having their own scrutinized. And that is basically the same thing as when you go to review your, you know, let's say you write, I don't know, an article. You write something and you go to review it yourself. Clark, you know about this. You try to proofread your own work and it's a nightmare. You can't see your own mistakes very well. Whereas somebody else does it and you look at the minefield, you get back and go, how did I miss that? <laughs> it's a similar thing here. You, you sort of don't know what you don't know, but when you mark others, you can see all of their faults very easily. That's, that's easy. So you see their faults, you come back and look at yours and you go, oh, oh shit, I've got the same mistakes myself. So that's something we're looking at incorporating as the next step on, on the sort of self marks exercises is whether we can take another stage of that where people mark each other's, get another degree more competent, and then just the final exercise um, we, can, we can mark and give them feedback on. So that wasn't too big a uh, hurdle, but the next one was probably the one that hit, hit me personally at least the hardest. People weren't finishing. So... You put all this, all this effort, all this sweat and tears, all your time into planning out these courses, doing these videos, building into them, and people just weren't finishing them. They were just dropping off. Other things come up, and that's that's pretty gut wrenching. Um, and then there was a commercial element added to the gut wrenchingness, where we had two or three of our our customers we've been working with for years, uh, as relatively early on these courses. And one of them said to us, oh, look, our people aren't finishing. You, you need to solve this or else we're not going to put more people through it, which is absolutely fair enough, but it just, it just drives it home even worse. So that was, this, this was a big one to solve. Um, people not actually finishing the course. So we had to do a bit of, uh, bit of searching into what are other online courses doing? How, how are they causing this? Um, 
And what was really interesting when we looked into that is, well, a lot of them just aren't fixing this problem, uh, which wasn't very helpful for us because we want to fix it anyway. But I found, a, I found an interesting study that was conducted over five years, massive study. 52% of learners of online courses never enter the courseware. Online course completion rate is only three to 6% of, of courses. Now this includes all those simple online freebies. But the most important thing about this is the last one. Of paid verified track. So when they say that, what they meant was you get formal recognition of learning. These tend to be industry bodies. Uh, they included universities in this. So even when you've got paid learning for which you get a formal certificate recognition for, still only 44 to 56% of people complete those courses. So what's really interesting about that is not, oh, well, we've got a problem just like everyone else. But this is really key. If you're looking at making a, a, a high value online course, it's, it's hard to get people to complete it. But getting your completion rates up high, like just to talk about our, our cohort that just wrapped up, I think it was uh, about 93, I forget where the rounding went, but anyway, about 93% um, completion on time. If you look at that, it's if you can do this for your courses, it's not just... Uh, you would think it's just, oh, well, people complete my courses, that's a bare minimum. It's actually not. It's actually a value add. It's a higher value thing than other courses out there. So it's a key thing that if you can get this into your courses, you can really have a, a higher value offering um, for people. That having a 93% completion course of, of a, you know, a more intensive course is actually a huge, a huge value out there. Something to be talked about. So this was, a, this was a big one to solve. And this was the cloud for this. In order to have a successful course, we must have uh, course accessibility. So that's very generic, but there's many different ways it sort of applies. Essentially, it means you know, people can, can get to it how they want to get to it, when they want to get to it, all these sorts of things. And in order to do that, we wanted to have just on-demand learning. You sign up for the course. If you want to complete it in a week, you take a week off work, you do it. If you want to complete it over six months, fine. We had a recommended flow to follow to get the most out of it, but you sign up whenever you want. The day you, the day you buy the course, the day you start it, whatever. On the other hand, in order to actually finish the course, and really that means get the most value out of it, um, we wanted to have a rigid structure because you give people a rigid structure. We had a very rigid structure when we were in person. You know, <laughs> you're, lo you're locked away at this location, Graham. <laughs> locked away at this location for seven days and you're not going anywhere you're not going to bed until we say so so <laughs> that was very rigid and that certainly got people finishing the course so this was a big one how do we how do we crack this and this was a case of us looking around at other online courses high value courses i found a guy that i, I worked with um this guy tiago worked with him uh three or four years ago, and he was running a really successful online course. And I was like, oh, I wonder how that's going. You know, how many people is he getting through it? It's a five-week um, course. How much is, you know, is it costing? Well, it costs about 2,000 Australian to attend his course. And he had, he only runs a cohort or two a year. So he started people all at the same time and had this, this cohort-based approach. But shit, he had 800 people attending the next cohort. So I was like, oh, okay, this guy knows how to run a course. <laughs> so of course, I, I did a bit of market research and bought a ticket to his course and, you know, <laughs> scurried through it, pinching everything I possibly could. Um, and it worked out very well. But the, the absolute key thing that, that we got out of all of this was the experience of it was just the cohort having a group of people moving through together. The magic of, you know, we're people. We like to work with other people. Um, impacting this. And what that did was it allowed, having cohorts allowed us to actually have both. So the structure is technically no more rigid than it ever was. We, you know, we're not enforcing people to do anything. We're not saying, oh, we're going to cut you off from the information. We're not, you know, we're not anything to, to try and enforce a rigid structure. We still have a rigid structure because it's a cohort now. So we've introduced um, group, those group exercises I talked about, we have a live session on a Tuesday and each week is aligned around a, a certain tool. So say week one is, is clouds, which week one literally is clouds. So um, you show up and you've got that. 
it's actually on-demand learning. You still do the learning when you want to, you submit the exercises when you want to, all of this thing. But you've got the magic of, of a bit of group learning, a bit of peer pressure, and wanting to be on the same level, not get left behind, that people just keep up. So they start at the same time, and people work together. I know that there's people that jump on sessions with each other outside of the structure of the, the, the course, and they work with each other. And it's this thing where by people, you know, all going through it together, people keep up and they and they focus on it, and they get through it. So it's an interesting thing where we've managed to have on-demand learning and we've we've still got the and we have a rigid structure for the cohort-based activities. So we actually have both and it seems to work wonderfully. Nobody's complaining about a, a brutal structure or how it's unreasonable or anything. But as I said, now we've got 93% completion on the course. So that was that was the most harrowing thing to overcome. And it wasn't as simple as um, I gotta say, as as uh solving the cloud. It was one of those uh very much a flying pig where we needed a reference environment because it just oh we'll do both. Sounds nice, but how the hell do we do that? Uh but cohorts was interestingly the the way to do both. So that's that's been massive, massive. Um so for anybody looking to do these kind of courses. Cohorts are key, getting groups of people together, they get to work together, they get all of that, and just people like doing it. They like working with others and, and proceeding together. So, so that's a that's a massive step. So I thought we were over, we were over all of that. Once we had the cohort structure and people were completing, they were keeping up, they were completing the course. We were getting really good feedback about the course materials and everything. And then after after a few calls, because I was calling everybody who attended the course at the end of them, asking them their feedback once they completed it, or this sort of thing, I noticed a very disturbing trend in our great fluency competency-based course was people weren't actually using the bloody tools at the end of it, which is <laughs> is the final slight. It's like, oh, what? They solve things on the course, but a few people's feedback was, oh yeah, well I finished the course and I'm not really sure how to use them. What do you mean you're not sure how to use them? You just did. But it turns out the interesting thing there was the realization that there's a huge difference between a simple, clear example that we build into videos and that, and you want a really high quality um, exercise built that we can mark and we can help you. As I say, it's that practice. Um, I keep forgetting the second step there. Rather than practice makes perfect, it makes permanent. So we want to we want to mark people such that they get competent. But in reality, things come up and you want to be able to whip together that messy thing on the right to solve them quickly and effectively. Really, the best thing about most of these tools is that you end up being able to properly analyze a subject and come up with a great solution relatively quickly and effectively. And that part was missing from the course. So the, the dilemma here on people using the tools, it turns out, the cloud around this, was to do with how technical our content was. So in order to have a successful course, we need people to have a good understanding of the tool. And in order to do that, we need technically correct content and to mark them in a, in a technical fashion. On the other hand, in order to have a successful course, we need people to actually use the tool. There's no point having the perfect tool that sits on the wall and you never use it. It's not really the perfect tool then. Uh, and in order to do that, we realized we needed more casual uh, content. But it, while it sounds like, why can't you just have both? And the formats we had and the videos that we had, it really doesn't work to have both. You can't have a technical, you know, a, a clear technical video followed by a rough one. It's, it's quite jarring and confusing. Um, and really the casual content, what you want to see is what do other people do with this? What does it look like when, when somebody else uses this tool? What does it look like when you use the tool? Was literally some of the questions. So that led to um, actually a fairly, fairly simple injection here, live sessions. So a live session is where I would come up with each week, a couple of cases of using a tool on things in my own life. And I would obviously think about the tool beforehand, but I made sure not to you know, write it out and make it too technically correct. So what I did was I'd actually just work through these on the call. And this is, we have these early in the week on a Tuesday, right? And this is, it's like night and day, it's magic. So just this one step of adding in this live session has been huge. So people get to see me doing a rough version, littered with spelling mistakes, with things I type in and they go, oh, no, that's not really it, and delete it and retype it. Um, so they see that, you know, you don't get it right first crack. You can just cross things out and rewrite them. See other things and go, 
oh, I wrote this and I really what I mean is that, but that's good enough for solving this simple problem. I think seeing and hearing all of that is critical to people realizing these aren't these polished things that need need to go into, you know, some academic journal. In some cases they might be, and that's great. When you want to use them that way, you can. But in most cases, these are relatively quick and dirty tools to solve things and just get, get on with it. And, and that was that was huge. So we introduced that over, over the last couple of cohorts. And the shift in hearing at the end of the cohort, I'm not sure how to use this with my wife, or I'm not sure how to use this in, a, in my team, or I don't really know how to get started. It's basically gone. And it's been replaced by people talking later in the course about using tools from earlier in the course. Oh, yeah, last week, actually, we had a drawer in the office. And I, I did one just, you know, in, in the Zoom meeting and, and solved it. I say in the office in the team and that shift is very very interesting so i guess the point here when you're looking at your own is you need the technically correct content you can't just rip that out because otherwise you know the, the quality will, will will go and people won't won't have a clear and like a clear resource to look back at to make sure that they understand um and everything however you really need to show them how you actually use it day to day seeing that this clean polished version on the left is it's nice to understand oh, okay i read that and i understand what the tool is now but it's really not great for seeing how am i actually going to use this whereas the thing on the right um we don't use this one in the course but this is essentially you know what i would do drawing one up in the course is you get to see all right here's the reality of it it's going to be rough but you're going to solve things and that's going to be great so when, when coming to your own, make sure, yeah, to, to where there are things that, you know, you want people to have technical understanding of it, you put the technical stuff in. When you want them to see how you actually do it day to day and get it done, do that. Make it casual. Make it show, show your workings. Show you cross things out. Show you scribble up, a you crush up a bunch of post-it notes when you're halfway through and throw them in the bin. Like it's important for people to see that so that they don't go, oh wow, oh, I thought I have to get it right first shot. No, I don't. <laughs> all right, so bringing all this together, uh, it's not luck. So the key three things to summarize are self-marked exercises, cohorts, and live sessions for, for us. And there's a bunch of other things, but as I said at the start, they all come under leveraged elements. That's, that's what we call it. It's not a probably technically correct term, doesn't really matter. But elements of the course that, as I say, either increase, oops, there we go, either increase outcomes while maintaining the amount of time you're committing, or they decrease your time while maintaining the outcomes for the learners. And I would strongly recommend if you're building a course, focus on the outcomes first. Get it to the quality standard you want while coming up with lots of clever things to maintain the amount of time you're putting in and then focus on switching that around. All right, we've got the quality we want. Now we want to scale this thing and to scale it, we need to reduce our time per person, but we don't want to reduce it down to a cheap course. So we've got to maintain that outcome while reducing our time per person. And that's, I guess that's where our focus has shift over the last say couple of months is, is the, the quality of the feedback, the outcome of the course, you know, the referrals that are coming out, but all of that has shown that we're at that great standard. Now it's about, all right, well, the cohorts are actually growing faster than we expected, which is fantastic, but it also means we need to focus on, all right, how do we reduce the time per learner while maintaining that same quality that they get, they get that the last two courses got. Brilliant. That's, that's fantastic, Peter. That, um, it, it feels like a little, uh, your story just feels like uh, well, the, the, the exact problem that I've been going through. And then you add on this time zones that, that, yeah. um, that, that's the bit that makes it hard. I'm doing a course at the moment where it, it's done most of this stuff uh, yeah. and they've got a few hundred people on it, I think. Uh, it's, it's similar to Tiago's course, but a, 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 a different one. Uh, oh, is it right but what they haven't got is the time zones. Um, it's called linking your thinking. Um, oh, okay. And it's, it's very similar, but that what they haven't got is the, the, the time zone bit. So for people like us, um it would be one o'clock in the morning for you or three o'clock and they've got no variation on it but anyway sorry that, that that's just uh, it's sorry it just resonates so much with the same kind yeah, of yeah. struggle no, I think a lot of us been through that's been fantastic um we haven't got much time 
uh, for questions, but just to give everyone a heads up, Peter doesn't know this, but uh, at some stage, we're going to have a live version of this that actually suits different time zones. And we're going to play back this video um, as a YouTube live thing. And then Peter's going to have a Q&A afterwards. Um, I, I presume that sounds pretty good. Yep. yep. Cool. Okay. Yeah, that's good. So um, just in, in, in terms of time, so if we just, uh, I just want to really just wrap it up. You've got lots of nice comments um, in there. And I think what you've done, Peter, there, uh, I know you've looked at it in, in retrospect, you know, you've looked back and you've untangled the journey, but beautifully put. And it's just oh, so you. resonates. I love how you use the clouds, but inside it, you had you had your bottlenecks, you had your, uh, your critical chain and you had just so much human behavior um, and oh, variability yeah. going on. It, it was just really fascinating. So thank you. Yeah. That's, um, actually, can, that's, can I, that's a good point. I'll just make very quickly. It's so yeah. easy to, well, it's not easy, but after a lot of it, uh, a lot of uh, blood, sweat and tears, as Graham can attest, it's relatively easy to control people's behavior when they've gotten locked in a room. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Online courses, not so much. <laughs> it's a lot harder. And I really resonated with the bit where you put the real cloud, um, versus the, the pretty one. I, I find with my books, people say to me, oh, it, was, it made so much sense in the, you know, when I read it in the book. Real life, our real life situation is so much harder. But, but well, what they don't realize um, and, until I tell them is that real life was um, messy like that. And then as part of communicating, which is what you guys do, exactly. you, you go through and you clean it up. Um, yep. But if you're problem solving out in the real world, you don't have to do the clean up version. You just have to get that, that light bulb moment. Exactly. Um, so can I just check? Uh, so, hey, Mariana, um, um, ready yourself in, in the background. <laughs> um, I'll bring you on in just a moment. Uh, but can I um, just check? It's blackbeltinthinking.com. Correct. Yeah. That's I'll where they should go. The next and if the people slide. want to find you, I presume there's not many Peter Cronins. There you go. Yep. There are not too many uh, Peter no, Cronins. there's not. On LinkedIn. Um, and I think my LinkedIn one, if you just go to the LinkedIn slash whatever, is just Peter Gronin. I managed to Brilliant. secure that somehow. I'm not quite sure Brilliant. now. That's good. And um, uh, just, just so I can do an advert for your Black Belt and Thinking uh, course, um, yep. I know it's really good. And I know there are people on here who have been through the live version. Uh, and uh, it, it's really, as we would say, uh, it's shit hot uh, and um, well worth going through that hard work that Peter's described. Um, uh, yeah, anyway, how about we just wrap it up there, Peter? Uh, can we just get a quick uh, thank you um, uh, in the, uh, the the chat there for Peter? And just, I just see, find... Clark, just one second. Uh, Vicky's asked when the next uh, intake is. And I know you asked me to provide everyone with a, with a lovely uh, discount. So yes. I had something... And Here's one I prepared earlier. Easily dump this in. The next two cohorts are uh, the 25th of October and the 10th of January. And as, as I just said, Clark asked for a, a nice discount. So I've got a, a code there for a 20% discount, which works out to 400 bucks. Um, so I'll just, look, I'll just dump all of that in there. So it'll probably disappear. But if you're interested, you can scroll back and find that for the, for the links to the next, uh, next cohorts and, and everything. Cool. Lovely. Beautiful job.